A few weeks ago, I put out a video ranking my top 10 games of 2022. In that video, I mentioned that I had played nearly 40 new releases in 2022, and in this video, I'll be ranking everything else I played that wasn't in my top 10. These rankings are according to how much I enjoyed the game when I played it. This is not necessarily a judge of game quality, though that can factor into my enjoyment if a game is just objectively bad. Then again, there are some games on this list that are objectively bad that I quite enjoyed. Also, just because I rank something that you liked lower on my list doesn't negate your feelings on the game. So drop a comment below with what you agree with and what you disagree with about this list. I know that there's a few games on this list that will probably make you pretty upset with me, but hey, it's all just one man's opinion, so let's get rolling. Coming in at the very bottom of the list, we have Digimon Survive. Nothing puts me in a sleepy state quite like visual novels. Hey, I get it, some people really, really like reading and I'm not trying to dog on you for that. It's a respectable skill and hobby to have. And there are even some games high up on this list that have a lot of reading involved. But man, when I play a game, I want to play the game. I want to get sucked into the gameplay loop and get hooked on the mechanics. If you're just going to plop down a mound of text the size of that dung pile in Jurassic Park, it better be worth diving into. Digimon Survive's dialogue wasn't, at least for me anyway. It's a lot of reaction lines like, whoa, what was that? And not a lot of interesting storytelling. The combat system seems like a solid tactical RPG, but they just don't give you much of it. When Digimon Survive was first announced, I thought it was going to be a survival game with Digimon. Can you blame me? As my grandpa used to say, that's what you get for thinking. Then I heard it was actually a tactics RPG and I was like, oh well, okay, that's still right up my alley. A few weeks before it was released is when I started hearing this was more a visual novel than it was a tactics RPG, and I'll admit, they lost me pretty big right there. I still wanted to give it a shot just to see if the story was good enough for me to play along, but it's just not. Not in the first five hours anyway, and if a game hasn't hooked me by then, uh, well then it's pretty much done for me. I have fond memories of being into Digimon as a kid and even liked it more than Pokemon at one point, but my nostalgia wasn't enough to carry me through Survive's lack of compelling writing. Honestly, it just left me wanting a new Digimon World game, which we are getting the latest one, Next Order, ported to the Switch soon, so maybe I'll dive into that one. At number 38, Relayer. When Relayer was first shown, I was immediately interested. A tactics game with beautiful mech cutscenes, an anime art style, and a PS5 release when my PS5 collection consisted of merely a handful of titles? This looked like something I needed day one. And I got it day one. Laid my $70 down. Yes, I was that desperate for PS5 games. Popped it into my PS5 and proceeded to be bored to tears by the lame story, terrible voice acting, insultingly simple combat maps, docile combat itself, and a mundane upgrade system. I was shocked to see this game has so many good reviews on Metacritic. I wondered if I was just like in a funk or something. And then Johnny from Happy Console Gamer made a video about how disappointed he was in the tactical mech game and what he said rang true. This is a budget game, a budget game they charge full price for. I'd like to say that I'll return to this again someday and finish it up, mainly because I paid so much for it, but I'll be honest, that sounds about as fun as chewing on an overcooked steak with a mouthful of impacted teeth. Perhaps the worst offense a game can commit is to be boring, and when it comes to boring, Relayer takes the cake. Number 37, Pokemon Legends Arceus. A lot of Pokemon fans don't really like when developer Game Freak deviates from their traditional Pokemon entries. Those fans especially hate when Game Freak makes anything other than Pokemon, which I can understand why, but then we couldn't get stuff like the incredible 2016 horse racing solitaire 3DS game Pocket Card Jockey. Seriously, go play this if you haven't. 
As someone who is pretty burned out on the traditional Pokemon experience, I welcome experimentation with this series. I'm actually surprised Game Freak hasn't made a farming sim style game where you play as a Pokemon breeder and deal with the trainers dropping off their monsters. Leading up to Pokemon Arceus' release, Ar Arceus's? Arceus? Arceus's? What, what's the plural on that? Leading up to Pokemon Arceus' release, I really didn't understand what the game was. I don't think Game Freak nor Nintendo did a great job of explaining the nature of the game. So I decided to wait on some reviews, and the reviews were all pretty damn good. The game has an overall score of 83 on Metacritic with an 8.2 user score, which is the more shocking number. People really dig this game. I asked a friend after he had a good amount of time with it, what exactly is it that you do here? What he described to me actually sounded a lot like an Atelier game. Going into open areas, collecting ingredients, fighting turn-based battles, crafting items, it sounded just like the games I love to play. However, what I played when I finally got my hands on Arceus felt like a half-finished experience. First of all, the Nintendo Switch's slagging hardware does the game absolutely no favors. Jagged edges and muddy textures are smeared all over this landscape, the novelty of sneaking up on a Pokemon wears off pretty quickly, and the gathering crafting just isn't satisfying to me. Combine that with a boring story and tedious quests, and I'm in the minority on this one. Despite my displeasure with the game, I still encourage Game Freak to keep trying stuff like this and I'd even encourage them to keep going on with this Legends series. Just hopefully next time, the game is a lot more fleshed out. And hopefully we're playing on much better hardware. Number 36, Madden NFL 23. In anticipation of me getting back into NFL football this year, I went ahead and bought Madden NFL 23. I haven't purchased a Madden game since Madden 18, a game I promptly traded in. I've always kind of been in the middle with Madden. I don't hate the game, nor do I have an agenda or vendetta against it. I've always been very vocal about how the direction they've taken the game has completely turned me off in recent years. So I thought I'd finally check back in with the game after such a long time. Franchise mode still sucks, which is probably the biggest thing for me because that's the only mode I would ever care to play in this game. The mode is still as lifeless as it was six years ago. You have very little idea of what's going on with the rest of the league, and there's no real driving motivator to play past winning the Super Bowl, which is about as rewarding as losing the Super Bowl, which is to say, it's not rewarding in the least. Nothing really matters, they keep trying to build on top of this extremely faulty foundation when they need to just blow the mode up and build anew. The suits aren't willing to invest the time and money into that, so we keep getting reheated decades old food at this point. The gameplay is fun to play, but it's also super easy to beat the CPU. Seriously, this is the easiest Madden I can ever remember playing. The CPU fumbles so often I was able to win the Super Bowl with the Saints in just my second year with a 68 overall rookie QB, and it wasn't even close. Another year where EA comes up well short of the goal line. Number 35, Made in Abyss. Made in Abyss is a survival game based off of a popular manga slash anime. This game had me intrigued for a very long time, I love survival games, and the gimmick of becoming more stressed the further you explore down the abyss was an interesting mechanic. I even almost broke down and watched the anime before I played the game, but I didn't, and I'm really glad I didn't waste my time. The first thing that soured me on this game was how annoying the voice acting was. The shrill voice of the main character was like Freddy's claws on a chalkboard. The combat is very basic and gets very frustrating, as the animations will trap you in a hit loop with some enemies. The navigation is probably the biggest miss with Made in Abyss. It's just really unintuitive and not very fun to explore. An exploration game that isn't fun to explore is, well, not good game design. The story is pretty interesting though, so maybe I will check out that anime at some point after all. Number 34, Mario Strikers Battle League. The Mario sports titles have technically been around since the days of the NES, with their quality ranging from middling to amazing and back down to middling in recent years. 
Last year's Mario Golf title was a solid game of golf, but when it came to single player content, there really wasn't much to entice me to continue playing. In fact, I haven't touched the game since I finished my review a year and a half ago. When the return of Mario Strikers was announced, many were excited, hoping for the glory days of Mario sports titles. Well, Mario Strikers was released this year, and while the gameplay itself is a fun game of soccer, the single player content has nothing to entice me to continue playing. Sound familiar? I just want to grab Nintendo by the cheeks and ask them why the hell are they holding back with single player content? I learned my lesson with Mario Golf, so Strikers wasn't that big of a disappointment to me, but the Mario Sports titles could be something so much more. I'd say Mario Strikers is even more bare bones than Mario Golf from last year. We're on a downward trajectory with these games, unfortunately. Number 33, Gotham Knights. Superheroes don't do much for me, so I don't typically get excited when a new superhero game is announced. This was the case with Gotham Knights. Unfortunately for those who do get excited over superhero games, Gotham Knights took a sour turn when it was announced that the game would only run at 30 frames per second, despite being a next-gen title. Shortly after that announcement, reviews were released and they painted a really ugly picture. Gotham Knights was not good. Like a buzzard in the desert, I circled the carcass of Gotham Knights and scooped in on Black Friday, picking it up for $35. And for a few weeks, Gotham Knights was much higher on this list. I was enjoying the game. The combat, although familiar, had enough depth to keep me interested, while the crafting and different suit combos gave me something to work toward. And then, the game completely bugged out on me. In the same spot. No matter how many times I restarted the game, the game would tank to less than 1 FPS. That tanked my experience, thus tanking Gotham Knight's spot on this list. What a shame. Number 32, Tunic. Before you get too upset about Tunic being this far down the list, I think it's a really cool game. I love the art style and the reverence for retro gaming that you can feel throughout. Tunic is clever and plays just fine. This just boils down to me not being into the type of game that Tunic is. Tunic is essentially a Souls-like, in the sense that it's a lot of trial and error. I just don't have much patience for that style of game these days, however if you do like those kinds of games, I would recommend giving Tunic a look. Honestly, Game Pass is the only reason I tried this, and I'm not displeased that I did, I'm just not ranking it highly because I wouldn't say I immensely enjoyed it. Number 31, Soul Hackers 2. I was really excited for Soul Hackers 2 when it was announced. I love the story and setting of the original game, and I'm a fan of first person dungeon crawlers. And I was ready to go back to all of that. And then I saw the game in action and was severely disappointed. Instead of the first person style of the original game, we got what we've been getting from Atlas's popular Persona series, third person dungeon crawling. Except these dungeons aren't nearly as complex or interesting as those in Persona, making Soul Hackers 2 feel like a lesser Persona. That's not to say Soul Hackers 2 has no merit at all, the characters have some interesting things going on, but the gameplay just killed it for me. Again, not bad, just a pretty big disappointment for me personally. Number 30, Monarch. Monarch was not on my list of games I wanted to play this year, but when the PS5 version dropped to $20 on Amazon, I decided to give it a shot. And yeah, I can see why it probably dropped so low so quickly. Not that I can outright say Monarch is a bad game, it's just not terribly exciting either. Especially not from a glance. You play as a student trapped in a school where weird mist fills some areas of the campus, causing students to go mad. Your character has the ability to go into this mist and pierce a dimensional veil, allowing you to destroy objects that rid the real world of this mist. There are some interesting concepts at play here for sure, but I haven't found the thing that would hook me into playing it through yet, but I do plan on coming back to Monarch at some point. Number 29, WWE 2K22. I did a whole review on this one, so I won't go on too long here about it, but WWE 2K22 was a bit of a return to form for 2K this year. 
While it's certainly not there yet, it's definitely better than it's been in quite some time. Not saying that that's a huge achievement, but I can say that I actually enjoyed my time with WWE 2K22, and while I haven't played the game since my review back in March, that speaks more to me just not really being into wrestling these days. I'm encouraged to see what they can do next year, but they still have a long ways to go to catch up. Number 28, Elden Ring. Oh boy, here we go. Now you're really gonna be mad. This is the one that's either going to make you shut this video off right now, or it's gonna make you hit that subscribe button. But hear me out. I fully recognize that this will be most people's game of the year, and I have no issues with that. If you were heavily anticipating this game, then it likely not only met your expectations, but exceeded them. And these days, that's a pretty big achievement with how hyped we tend to get for our favorite franchises. Elden Ring is Dark Souls with an open world. If you love Dark Souls, then that probably feels like a significant jump for the franchise. Me? I've never been a fan of these games. Going back to when I worked at GameStop and checked out Demon Souls for the PS3, I just don't find the gameplay loop to be an enjoyable one. Challenge? Definitely. Atmospheric? For sure. Fun? Not for me. You hate me, don't you? No, 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 I don't hate you. And that's not to say that I didn't like any part of Elden Ring. I actually did like exploring the open world that FromSoft has presented here, and while it's nowhere near as interesting to me as exploring a Fallout or Elder Scrolls world, I really enjoyed the gameplay loop in these areas. However, once you get into the linear dungeons, it just feels like a regular Dark Souls game again. And I think that's where it loses me. To everyone who loves this game, I understand why, but Elden Ring didn't win me over. Number 27, Kirby and the Forgotten Land. Kirby is near and dear to my heart. One of the earliest videos on this channel was me talking about how Kirby's Adventure on the NES was the first game I ever bought. I played the hell out of that game and to this day, I can jump back in and play it from muscle memory. Kirby has some great titles throughout his long lifespan, but at some point, the games just got to the point where they didn't stimulate me as they once did. When I saw Kirby in the Forgotten Land, I got really excited because it looked like we were finally getting an open world Kirby game, just what the series needed to freshen it up. Well, that's not at all what this game is. It's actually a very linear 3D platformer, and even then, I'd hesitate to call it that. That being said, the game is a pleasant experience. Kirby's new ability, dubbed the Mouthful Mode, is funny if nothing else. Forgotten Land might not have much in the way of new experiences, but it does have a lot of charm. It's just not exactly what I'm looking for in new video games these days. Number 26, Ayudin Chronicle Rising. When it was announced that the original members of the Suikoden team would be launching a Kickstarter to create a spiritual successor, since Konami doesn't seem to be interested in continuing the Suikoden series themselves, even though we are getting remasters of the first two games soon, fans lined up to show their support in droves. While that game, Ayudin Chronicle 100 Heroes, is still on the horizon, the new team released this precursor, Ayudin Chronicle Rising which isn't a turn-based RPG, but rather a 2D action RPG. I was astonished at just how good this game looks. The backgrounds are mesmerizing. And although I despise the flash animation style movements of the characters, the combat is pretty fun. It's pretty basic to start, but you start unlocking abilities as you go, and you can swap characters at will, which helps with variety. My biggest problem with this game is how wordy it is. The action segments are often broken up by lengthy dialogue with very little in the way of voice acting. Still, when the game let me play, I did have a decent amount of fun. Number 25, The Diofield Chronicle. The release parade from Square Enix was in full effect when The Diofield Chronicle came out. I played the demo and really enjoyed the combat mechanics so much that I went and pre-ordered the game. For some logistical reason, I didn't end up getting the game for over a week after its release. But when I finally was able to dig into the game, I realized that this was very much a mechanic that needed a game instead of a game that needed a mechanic. The gameplay is the star of the Diofield Chronicle, which sounds great, but the story and setting are so dry. 
that you really have to be honed in on that style to enjoy it. At least that's how it was for me. I was dying to get to the next battle, which is not a great feeling because a lot of those battles feel similar. Still, if you're a fan of strategy games, the Diofield Chronicle is worth a shot. Number 24, Valkyrie Elysium. In the fever dream that was 2022 where it seemed like every game released was published by Square Enix came Valkyrie Elysium, an attempt to resurrect the Valkyrie Profile series. Valkyrie Elysium is an action RPG that's fun to play but ultimately wears out its welcome pretty quickly. After the first main quest took over an hour to complete, I was ready for a long break. Mix that with a story and setting that interests me very little, and it's a game I do plan to come back to at some point, but I'll be in no rush. Number 23, Sifu. Sifu may be the game that's dropped the furthest on my list over time. My first impressions of Sifu were very positive, as the hand-to-hand -hand Arkham style combat felt really good and offered the depth that is sorely needed with that style. This game was once in my top 10, but over time, I've really soured on the progression in this game. I like the idea of a roguelite where each time you die you get older, but unlocking abilities was really confusing and often didn't feel rewarding enough. Sifu is a solid game that doesn't quite hold up the longer I play it. Number 22, Dying Light 2. Dying Light 2 was one of my most anticipated games for 2022. Although it gave me motion sickness at times, the first Dying Light game was a sleeper hit for me, and I really enjoyed playing the game despite its lackluster story. The first person parkour felt great when it wasn't making me nauseous, and the melee combat felt meaty. Through several delays, Dying Light 2 finally hit the scene this year, and it hit with a whimper. I still had fun playing the game as the parkour is still exciting and the combat is on the same level as the first game if not better. The story does improve but only slightly in my opinion. It's a big world to explore with a fair amount of challenge and stuff to do. It's just not as compelling as I was hoping it would be. Number 21, Saints Row. Yeah, I'm really putting Saints Row ahead of Elden Ring. Again, this isn't a list critiquing quality here so much as it's simply a list of the games that I enjoyed the most this year, and I really did have more fun playing Saints Row than I did Elden Ring. The reviews for this game were mostly scathing. I've actually never been a fan of the Saints Row games, especially the later ones, as I don't really click with the over-the-top humor and gameplay that they offer, but I decided to rent the game from Gamefly and check it out, and I actually had a hard time pulling myself away from it. Firstly, I'm a sucker for the southwestern setting. I love the desert, and I feel like it's not represented very well in gaming. Fallout New Vegas did a fantastic job with it, as did Forza Horizon 5 last year, and I think there's a lot more meat on that bone should more designers opt to set their games there. A Fallout or a Grand Theft Auto would be fantastic somewhere in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona. Saints Row's map is pretty big, and even though a lot of reviewers chastise the map for not being unique, I disagree. Sure, it's not what I would expect from the next Grand Theft Auto, but I think it's sufficient enough. Listen, I'm not saying that this game should win any Game of the Year awards. It certainly has its faults and feels like a game from 15 years ago, for better and worse, but I had a good amount of fun with this one, and I plan to pick it up once it hits the $20 price point. If you want some mindless fun with some character progression and a nice southwest setting, give Saints Row a shot. Number 20, Horizon Forbidden West. Horizon Forbidden West was another one of my most anticipated games of 2022. After initially not liking Zero Dawn due to its dated feeling game mechanics and unappealing story, I ended up loving it once I finally got to the mystery behind the Zero Dawn name some 20 hours in. I was excited to see the story continue and to venture west, exploring many of the locations that I'm familiar with and have actually been to. Because I was busy with other titles at the time, I decided to wait on Forbidden West and I actually first played it in December. And man, it feels like Gorilla didn't really learn their lesson from the first game. This game is starting out slow and boring story-wise. While the gameplay is still fun and the graphics are beautiful, I'm seeing more glitches than I did in Zero Dawn. 
I just don't feel like Guerrilla responded to the criticisms of the first game and have doubled down on everything. In some ways, that does pay off, but in other ways, it once again makes the game feel dated. I intend to see Forbidden West through till the end because of my experience with Zero Dawn, and I hope it eventually hooks me like Zero Dawn did, but much faster this time. Number 19, Potionomics. Potionomics, as good as it is, is a game I felt should have been even better. You play as someone who inherits a potion shop from her uncle after he passes away. The shop is run down and it turns out that your uncle owed a mountain of debt that you also inherited. You have to clean up the shop and learn how to become a master alchemist in order to win competitions and erase your uncle's debt. The best thing about Potionomics for me was the haggling system, which presents in the form of a card battle game. This was by far the most fun I had with Potionomics and I wish there was more of it. The gameplay loop of buying ingredients when costs are low, capitalizing on the random effects that pop up from day to day, brewing potions by balancing ingredients, and really trying to maximize your profit every day is addicting. I just wish the other game mechanics were as compelling as the haggling is. I'm also not a big fan of the art style, although I do tip my cap to it for being well done. It just reminds me of Pixar characters, which I know is the point, but I don't like the Disney Pixar style. It creeps me out. I also found all of the side characters to be annoying and didn't want to use the hangout feature for any of them. But these are preferences, and I acknowledge that. Someone who does like this motif will likely really enjoy Potionomics. Number 18, The Quarry. Supermassive games burst onto the scene in 2015 with the PS4 exclusive Until Dawn, which allowed players to make consequential choices for characters placed in a slasher movie setting. I quite enjoyed Until Dawn, even though I thought the villain and the setting were ultimately forgettable. Supermassive continued their narrative-driven works in the following years with the Dark Pictures anthology, but they hit us with a game more akin to Until Dawn this year in The Quarry. The cast in this game is stellar. Ted Raimi, David Arquette, Brenda Song, Lynn Shay, Lance Henriksen, and on. Some of my favorite actors from some of my favorite movies. The story is fairly cliche, but that's fine with me. I actually enjoyed the quarry more than I did Until Dawn, and the twist of the story is a fun one. I don't want to spoil anything, so I'll stop there, but I do look forward to playing this game multiple times to see the different possibilities. Number 17, MLB The Show 22. Here's another game I did a full review on, so if you want my detailed thoughts, go check that out. Basically, the show is the game I play the most of every year. Each baseball game takes about an hour to play, and I usually use that as my treadmill game or a game I play to untangle my brain before I go to sleep. I'm actually pretty disappointed in the show's lack of progress, especially when it pertains to franchise mode. But there's no denying for me that the gameplay on the field is great. I rarely ever experience bugs, I get realistic results, and the game looks fantastic. I'm a huge baseball fan, so the fact that I do think this is a quality game but it's so far down on my list probably tells you how bummed I am that they just won't take the next step with their single player modes. Number 16, Live Alive. Live Alive is a game that I've wanted to play ever since I heard the concepts behind this Super Famicom RPG. A tale split between several protagonists ranging from cavemen to future space seemed like an awesome idea. And it is. Square Enix hit Live Alive with the HD 2D treatment and it looks gorgeous. I think this actually looks better than Octopath Traveler or Triangle Strategy. It lends itself to brighter colors and a different look at the graphic system than the darker games we've seen so far. Unfortunately, the RPG mechanics aren't quite as interesting as the premise and the art style of this one, as it's a rather shallow experience, and I think that's what's ultimately keeping this one out of my top 10. Still, this was a nice palette cleanser, and I hope we continue to get more games with big ideas like Live Alive. Number 15, Let's Build a Zoo. While I am a big fan of the simulation genre, 
I've never been able to get into zoo sims. I usually get bored pretty quickly. Let's Build a Zoo doesn't really give you much time to get bored as it's constantly presenting you with opportunities, new simulation systems, and choices to make that can negatively or positively affect your zoo. Everything makes sense and the actual animal management is interesting as animals can breed and need to be stimulated to get the most out of your return. You can trade animals with other zoos across the world, buy animals off the black market, allow science experiments with crazy crossbreeding. There's just a lot jam-packed into this game, and the more you play it, the deeper it goes. Really enjoyed my time with this one. Number 14, Bear and Breakfast. Ah, Bear and Breakfast. This is a game that had it not been pretty borked on the Switch, which was a system I played it on, I could see this cracking my top 10. The gameplay loop of fixing up rooms to rent out to people, earning money to fix up new places in different areas, and then juggling all those B&Bs is a lot of fun. And doing it as a big fluffy bear is charming as hell. The writing is also pretty witty, but man, the controls on the Switch are a pain to deal with. I was constantly forgetting how to open up certain menus, and even when I did remember, it was sometimes a fight to do. Add on top of that some stuttering and many crashes, and I just couldn't put it any higher than this, but I do hope they get around to fixing it because I would love to dive back in, but I'd rather wait for a more pleasant experience. Number 13. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge I really only have good things to say about TMNT Shredder's Revenge. The game has a gorgeous art style that is not only an homage to the great Turtles arcade games of the past, but it's also worthy of praise independent of those older games. The gameplay feels great, the music is awesome, and I don't know a Turtles fan that's played this and doesn't like it. That speaks volumes of what a great job Tribute Games did here. It really is one of the best spiritual successors ever made. So why is it this low on my list? It simply comes down to the beat-em-up genre not being one of my favorites. These days, I'm really looking for games that offer more depth than short bursts of fun. But as far as short bursts of fun go, it's hard to do better than Shredder's Revenge. Number 12, Grounded. This one is a bit iffy since Grounded has been in early access for years now, but Obsidian had its official release for Grounded this year and I put it on my list because the last time I played Grounded, which was around the initial early access release, it was way different than it is now. Man, talk about systems. Grounded is a hardcore survival game with a lot going on in the background. And this is a hard survival game. It may feature shrunken kids in a cartoon art style, but don't be fooled because this game will mess you up. And I think the difficulty was a bit too much for me. Although you can adjust the difficulty, I felt progression was a little too slow, which killed momentum and therefore killed some of the fun I had with the game. That being said, Obsidian has created a wonderful world here with some hardcore mechanics, which is exactly the thing that stimulates me as a gamer at this time in my life. And number 11, the best of the rest, Harvestella. Just missing the top 10 this year is Harvestella. When it was announced that Square Enix was going to try their hand at a Rune Factory-esque farming RPG, I just about lost my mind. The farming slash life sim genre is definitely one of my favorites, and I would love to see more of these well-known publishers getting into the simulation business. So why did Harvestella miss my top 10 then? Well, while I do think Harvestella is a good game, I wouldn't put it high on my list if I didn't think that, it leans too far into the adventure RPG territory, and the farming sim elements suffer because of that. Not to mention that there aren't really any life sim elements to speak of early on, instead farming becomes just a way to make money to fund your adventures, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Some people will prefer this, and that's cool, but for me, 
As someone who now considers themselves a veteran in farming sims, it just feels shallow. Take cooking for example. In most life sims, you would buy seeds for a small amount, grow the crop, the crop would then fetch a bit more than the seeds would, but if you took it a step further and used that crop to cook something, that dish would then fetch a considerable amount more than just the bare crop. That's not really how it works in Harvestella. Even if you go through the hassle of cooking a dish, the return for the dish is going to be about the same as if you sold all those crops by themselves. Unless you're cooking something for a quest, which is where I have to shovel heaps of praise upon Harvestella. When you finish a quest, the rewards actually feel rewarding. Go figure, right? Making a certain dish and delivering it to a quest giver will give you a ton of money, allowing you to upgrade your farm or your combat gear, and there's a really nice sense of progression to Harvestella, which again comes at the cost of the farming sim aspect, but that's okay. It's alright to have a game that just uses farming as a means to an end. I also have an issue of how talkative the quest sections are in this game. A quest is usually go here, talk to this person, then they send you over there to talk to someone else. It really does make for some boring stretches, unfortunately. The combat is really simple, but I like it that way. The game wants you to juggle job classes and swap them out constantly, based on the variety of enemies it gives you. Not every game's combat needs to be Elden Ring. There's room for challenging and passive combat experiences in one's gaming repertoire. While I had hoped this was more Harvest Moon than Secret of Mana, I think we got the latter. Still, Harvestella is a really cool game and I'm glad that it exists. The art and music are top notch and it's a very relaxing game to play. And there you have it. I actually played even more new releases than this in 2022, but these were the games I played enough of to feel like I got where they were going. Maybe at some point when I've had a chance to spend some more time with some of these games, I'll re-rank everything just to see how different it looks. As always, thanks for watching. Until next time, this is Lex, signing off.